Uh, good morning and welcome to the 20th, se uh, 20th meeting of the fourth session of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Um, can I ask all members with electronic devices such as phones to switch them to silent because they will interfere with our system. And um, you will probably note that some of our members may be using tablet devices and this is to ensure that we can actually follow proceedings. Um, apologies for more convener. Uh, he's stuck in traffic, um, so I am uh, convening the meeting until he arrives. Uh, I'm Dennis Robertson. I'm the uh, deputy convener of the committee. The first item of business is, can I ask members if they're content to take item four in private? Uh, thank you for that. If we move on, um, <clears throat> we've got a, an array of witnesses this morning uh, and a very important uh, evidence session. Uh, I will ask the witnesses to introduce themselves and perhaps to give a brief statement um, as they do so. And brief, can you, as I say, can you give maybe a, a brief statement uh, as, uh, as an introduction? And can I perhaps start with uh, Professor Claire Bambra? Hi, um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm Claire Bambra, I'm Professor of Public Health Geography at Durham University. Um, I've done research into work and health and health inequalities for over a decade and I submitted some written evidence, um, particularly around the quality of work from a public health perspective, around things like the psychosocial work environment, the physical work environment and contractual terms and conditions, as well as some evidence-based recommendations for how a committee like this could try and improve the relationship between job quality and health and wellbeing outcomes. Thank you for your brevity. <laughs> Our next witness, please. I'm Lorna Kelly. I'm the Associate Director at Glasgow Centre for Population Health. The centre was set up around 10 years ago to look at the, the causes of health and inequalities in Glasgow and in particular <clears> to work alongside other organisations on, on how we can address those. Um, and, and I would particularly want to bring today some evidence from work we've done around in-work poverty and with particular groups on the, the impact of poverty and the nature of um, work in the changing labour market and particularly cycling between work, low-paid work and, and no pay. Thank you very much. Oh. Hi there, um, I'm Martin Talbot from NHS Health Scotland um, and we're obviously very interested in the role that um, work plays in both um, improving population health and reducing health inequalities um, and as previously submitted evidence to the committee. Um, on those areas. And our final witness. Hello, good morning. My name is Sarah Jones. I'm head of the uh, Director's Office in Scotland uh, for the Health and Safety Executive. Um, uh, we welcome the opportunity to give evidence to this inquiry. Um, for HSE, this is potentially a very broad topic, so just a little bit about our positioning in the context of this inquiry. Um, our remit and our powers are quite specific. Our role is to prevent uh, work related ill health and disease um, caused by work activity. Um, we're not in the role of health, general health promotion, which is outside our statutory remit. We're very much um, uh, about um, looking at the evidence of what causes work-related ill health and disease based on um, expertise and evidence which we draw from a, a wide range of specialisms uh, across the whole of Britain. Uh, you have a written submission about um, some of the work that we're doing uh, to prevent uh, ill health. Um, the one thing that isn't mentioned in the written submission, and I just want to mention it now, is that we have recently set up a new workplace health expert committee. Uh, and we can provide more information about that. But I noticed that in some of the submissions to the inquiry already, um, uh, some of that evidence has been from Professor John Cherry, and he is a member of the Workplace Health Expert Committee set up by HSE, and it is looking at new and emerging risks uh, in terms of health at work. Yeah, thank you, and I'm sure we would welcome um, the, that evidence coming forward. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go straight into questions, uh, but can I just also uh, say to members that uh, the Health Committee have been looking at this as well and some of our witnesses have been before the Health Committee as well uh, looking at the impacts uh, on a, a work in terms of health related uh, illnesses and, and we're going to try and sort of focus more 
um, on the the impact on the economy and some of the wider issues around that. Um, because, as I say, um, the, the Health Committee have been looking at this as well. Can I start uh, by asking Patrick Harvey? Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I think the whole committee is very aware that far more than just pay levels are, are involved here. But I'd, I'd like to start with uh, pay levels, if that's all right. Uh, some of the written evidence that you've submitted uh, looks at the potential uh, beneficial impact of increases to the minimum wage, for example, uh, and a promotion of the living wage. Uh, given that for more than 120 years, the concept of a living wage has been based on a calculation about what people need to live a, a decent life. Uh, and the UK government now appears to be wishing to break that uh, and rebrand an increase to the minimum wage level for over 25s only as a living wage. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about the impact that we might anticipate that policy change having, either directly on the people who see their level of, of income increase, if they're over 25 and they're currently on minimum wage, they'll see an increase, but also on the impact of those left behind because they're under 25 and they don't get that benefit, uh, or potentially from employers who think paying the living wage is a good thing but then don't feel that they need to keep pace with actually the cost of living, which uh, the calculation of a, of a meaningful living wage is clearly going to go up, given some of the other welfare changes that are coming through. So I wonder if you could um, reflect on the anticipation we might have about the health impact and the well-being impact uh, of that particular policy change. Would you like to direct your question to Patrick in the first um, instance? Well, I'm happy to throw it open to whoever would like to comment. I think um, Claire Bambra was reacting visually at, at some point, so maybe we could start there. Um, yes, I mean, I'll take one part of quite a, a thorough and complicated question. Um, in terms of the changes to the um, national minimum wage, obviously being accompanied by reductions in tax credits. So whilst there's an increase, which from a health perspective, an increase in income up to a certain point would be a good thing. Um, obviously, the removal of tax credits, um, particularly for women, um, um, with, with children and so on would obviously be seen as having a negative effect and certainly we've been doing some research at Durham University around the wider welfare reform agenda of the UK government and that has begun to show um, that there are indeed negative health impacts as, as, as the rest of public health literature would suggest. So I think I would anticipate that the health effects of the combined measure of an increase whilst there's a reduction, means that most people aren't getting an increase, would actually end up having a negative health effect. But that is extrapolation. We would have to study it over time as it evolves. Anyone else? Um, I, th I think I would endorse the, the point that we need to look at pay and the welfare and benefit system together so that we're looking both at total individual income but also at total household income. Um, you specifically mentioned the issue of the, the under 25s, um, and I think that is an area of growing concern, both for those individuals, but also because often those are individuals that are part of a household, may in many cases have, have children. Um, and so we, we can talk about the potential benefits of a, a living wage or even the new national living wage, but you've, you've then got a group of people who not only would be impacted on um, by not receiving that, but also potentially sets up issues for them for, for the rest of their lives and for the rest of their households. And some of the evidence that Joseph Rowntree Foundation, for example, have gathered have looked at groups who are most at risk of getting stuck in this cycle of either being in, stuck in low-paid work or cycling between unemployment and low pay. And young people are particularly vulnerable to that for, for a range of reasons. So I think we would have some concerns about the potential impacts on under-25s and what that might lead to. Thank you. Martin, we should go on the line. Um, I, I suppose um, maybe just to, to add a, a couple of points to that, I guess we would we would reiterate um, again that it's, well, increasing wage levels is very welcome and make an important contribution. This is, this is about household incomes. Um, so that would include things like tax credits. We've, we've covered this, this ground previously and the role that they can play in supporting incomes. Um, and also, too, about um, the interaction with um, hours, um, so that, for example, even if um, all things are there f favourably, 
um, and wage levels are there, and even even indeed if, if other measures were there to support families with children, for example, um, there's still a question of would they be able to secure enough hours to do so. Um, the Joseph Rowntree um, Foundation, I think, has just published some some evidence on on that, and maybe the committee would like to consider consider that as well. Patrick, I'm not sure if. Sarah Jones we, wants to... we, we don't have a role in contractual employment matters or pay, but Martin's mentioned hours of work. Um, we, are, we look at hours of work from the other perspective. Rather than underemployment, um, we enforce the um, maximum uh, weekly hours and uh, nighttime working. We have, it's not our legislation, but we have a role in enforcing that. Um, I was looking at the statistics that have just come out uh, a few days ago actually from the office for national statistics about the relationship between wealth income and personal well-being and this uh, is is based on uh, data that was gathered from 2011 to 12 um it breaks down you know income inequality and wealth inequality uh, in terms of an impact on life satisfaction sense of worth happiness and anxiety um you know, this is clearly only one way of measuring these these things, but uh, it does seem to me that while a lot of the, this discussion is about the lowest paid, a lot of this discussion is about you know whether we should increase the minimum wage, whether we should have a living wage, and so on. Um, there seems to be a need to recognise as well that the impact of high pay seems quite marginal. That if somebody's already doing all right. Uh, increasing their pay beyond that doesn't necessarily have a great impact in terms of a, a benefit to their health and well-being. Um, if an MSP, for example, who earns, I think, 50, 58,000, was 10 grand richer or 10 grand poorer, it probably wouldn't make a great deal of difference to our health or our well-being. Whereas that seems to be where the, the economy has gone in recent years, of increasing the share of the national wealth that goes to the very wealthiest. Um, the Scottish Government's economic strategy makes it clear that the, the wealthiest 17% of society are those who've seen this incredible spike in their share of the, the, the pie, if you like, in, in terms of, of income. Uh, and the bulk of the rest of the population have seen a reduction in, in their share. Doesn't this suggest that we actually need to, to focus not just on a safety net at the bottom, not just on minimum wages, but on how we share the wealth of the whole economy uh, and whether uh, a, a, an increasing share is, is being hoarded uh, disproportionately by a small number. Um, <clears throat> shall I comment on that? Just yeah. a, a couple of things to say. One, one is that um, absolutely income makes a contribution to inequalities across society, and we know from a number of sources that inequality is is bad for health and it's not just bad for the health of the poorest but bad for the health and the outcomes of everybody. Secondly, I think we know that inequality is um, it is also increasingly being seen as bad for economic growth um, and that's increasingly recognised by people like the OECD that, that having a society where, where there are inequalities in both in income and wealth but also in opportunity is very bad for overall e economic growth. Um, and I would also say that there's a further impact of high wage growth in certain sectors, and that's around uh, affordability of other goods and services within the economy. And house prices is probably the most obvious example of that. So you, you have um, a, a, a growth in income in certain sectors driving house prices, for example, which then takes things out of the reach of other people. So there are a number of impacts of the inequality as well as just the absolute pay level, as you say. Um, I would agree with your comments and then those of Lorna about the effects of income inequality on population health. And obviously there's a lot of studies by people like Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett that have shown that, that kind of relationship. However, um, looking at your curve around the income and, and wealth, obviously from a public health perspective, if you do help the people at the bottom, you will get the most health gain because the gap is actually between the most deprived 10% and the next block of 10% is actually much bigger than any other step along the gradient. So whilst I would personally support and the evidence supports your position around income inequality, there is still a case, I think, to kind of do this proportionate universalism of more for the poorest because you'd get more public health gain. 
but the, the way to get that maximum benefit is to achieve precisely the opposite of what's been happening in the economy for the last few years. Yes, and you would obviously be able to do it if you took from the top. You'd yes. have the opportunity to give to the bottom. We can redistribute income and we, can own, we, we can't redistribute health, but we can influence the distribution of health over time through income distribution. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, Patrick. If we look at the moment and the impact of the uh, review of the Social Security uh, benefit system, what what impact is, do you believe that's having on um, the, the, mo the the poorest people within our communities? Those that are maybe in work but um, have insufficient hours, or those trying to get into work, uh, for instance, on GSA, etc. So, with this review, and, and Patrick's mentioned this already, in, in some cases, um, there's a, a significant area of people that are out of the the, the benefit structure, trying to well, well, basically, it's it's suggesting that if you're under 25, uh, you better stay at home, more or less. What impact is th is that having? Do you think, Professor? Um, I mean. I think more, the more general point about the restructuring of the welfare support and effectively the decrease in the welfare support is beginning to have noticeable effects on health inequalities between areas, between social groups. Obviously, incomes are going down, as was pointed out by Patrick Harvey, for some whilst going up considerably for others. In terms of the particular effect on younger people, um, I haven't studied that in my research, but obviously they are people who are more likely to be on zero hours, for example, are experiencing more this kind of precarious um, labour market and welfare system that we're now developing and have less access to the benefit system even as it currently exists. So you could argue that there's a bit of a generational gap around that. So the rights that still exist around social welfare are probably disproportionately um, held by people over 25 than under. But from a health perspective, I haven't studied that, but perhaps some of my colleagues have. Um, a, a couple of comments, and, and a lot of this comes from research we've done with, with lone parents about their experience of particularly being, being on job seekers allowance and the implications that has for, for work. Um, uh, and one is that the focus of the work programme and job seekers allowance is around getting into, into any job. Um, and that can often drive people into taking the first job which becomes available and the focus is much less on sustainability of that, that work. So we see, for example, in lone parents a, a high rate of exit again from the workplace. So people are getting jobs then being unable to sustain those jobs because of changes to hours or, or lack of ability to reconcile with child caring commitments. So an issue I think about how um, the Job Seekers Allowance and Work Support is focused on getting into work but not necessarily on, on sustaining that, uh, on sustaining, um, in sustaining that work. Um, I think another, another issue around the kind of things which help people to get into better quality work and qualifications being one of those. So some evidence we've heard from people about the difficulties in pursuing further education, for example, because of some of the changes um, to the welfare and benefit system uh, and, and the, um, the lack of ability to claim benefits when, when you're studying and that challenging people's ability to improve themselves to get greater qualifications, which give, then give them more choice in the labour market market and more chance to get a, a better job. Uh, can I just suspend the meeting for uh, 30 seconds to allow our convener to take the chair? Thank you. Okay, if we can reconvene, my apologies for my uh, late arrival. Something to do with a cycle race uh, in Edinburgh. And my thanks to the Deputy Convener for uh, ably holding the fort in my absence. Uh, I think we go back to Patrick Harvey at this stage. Uh, I had come more or less to the end of right. the, the um, pay level in questions that I uh -huh. had. I, I was going to 
come on to uh, nighttime yep. working later on, but I don't know if other members want to pursue the issue about wages, first of all. Okay, does anyone want to come in on, on wages at the moment? Lewis MacDonald? I think there's a general point which, which relates to wages, which would be helpful to hear a little more about, and that's the issue around insecurity in work, uh, as, uh, which clearly is related, or of which low pay is, is one feature. And I wonder if um, the witnesses would like to add to the very strong written evidence that they've provided, which demonstrates that uh, insecure work and low-paid work can sometimes be very bad for health, even relative to unemployment. And, and there's clearly, clearly quite a lot to say on that, and I wonder if Lorna Kelly, yeah. um, I think two, two things I'd want to, to cover on that. One is about insecurity of employment status, and the other is about insecurity of hours and, and wage levels. Um, so uh, insecurity of employment status, feeling that you either can't sustain your employment or that you're at risk of, of losing that, um, creates a huge amount of, of stress and impact on, on mental health and ability to, to plan and manage for, for your family. I think this, the, the, second, um, the second issue around insecurity of, of, of income, um, the concept of things like zero hours work where perhaps the hours that you're going to get on on a week-to-week -week basis are not known um, your wages may fluctuate from from week to week makes it very difficult for families to plan and and manage their money and to know that they're going to be able to um, uh, afford just the day-to-day -day bills and lots of evidence that that kind of financial stress um, uh, has an impact on on mental health So have um, longer term effects, uh, not just obviously in terms of um, um, psychosocial and, and health related to stress, but obviously that studies have shown that uh, um, chronic stress exposure through things like uh, temporary and insecure work is associated with increased risk of mortality, particularly from cardiovascular disease, for example. There's also evidence that people involved in insecure work are more likely to engage in risky health behaviours, so smoking, alcohol, etc. It's not entirely clear why that might be, um, but there's some speculation w within the um, literature that it's to do with issues around future orientation, about people's not being able to plan for a future, um, reflecting what Lorna said, which you could then see people perhaps engaging in a kind of who cares way, live for today, because that's the environment they're in and they can't plan beyond the end of the week. Um, in terms of, for example, the zero hours, I just refer to an earlier point I made where, of course, if people are on not knowing what hours they're doing, potentially doing regularly less than 16 hours a week, then obviously they're not, the employers are not having to pay national insurance and things like that. So then that can have an impact, obviously, over the life course on people's income, not just their ability to save and predict, but also what benefits that they get from the states. So again, we have this situation of a kind of two or three tiered welfare state. And uh, reflecting Dennis Robertson's point earlier, it, this will be affecting younger people, um, new migrants into the country, and there is evidence that, that women are more likely to be in temporary work than men. So there are um, different levels of inequality within this situation. Martin Talbot previously made the point that uh, tax credits had been uh, a mechanism to attempt to address that low pay issue or the difference, if you like, between the minimum wage and the living wage that people need to actually survive upon. Do witnesses have a view on how effective, how effectively tax credits did that job? And equally, do they have a view on the consequences of uh, uh, the ending of some of those tax credits, which is currently planned? And I guess Martin, having mentioned it, might want to kick <laughs> off on that one. Well, I suppose we can just, we can just um, underline... Um, the previous modelling work that was done to the investment in inequalities uh, work, which um, suggested the, the quite um, positive role that increasing tax credits would play in both um, improving population health and reducing health inequalities. Um, again, this is by extrapolation, but you, you might suggest that reducing them would not be likely to improve um, health or reduce inequalities. Um, so, there's that. Um, yeah. Some other members who want to come in, actually. 
Yeah, I was just to say, yeah. I, that, that seemed a slightly abstract version of it, and I wondered if, if there's been any studies done that might put meat on those bones. Um, uh, yeah. Not an area I have a huge expertise in, but one of the issues that frequently comes up is the ability of um, the, the welfare and benefits system to be flexible enough to respond to fluctuations in income. Um, and, and tax credits are, are, are part of that, but there's a range of other, both direct and passported benefits. So one of the concerns that people have moving into work, which may be unpredictable or zero hours contracts, is the speed at which the benefit system is able to, to, to respond to that uh, and the number of different places that they may need to go, for example, to, to continue housing benefit for, for a period. Um, so that flexibility to adapt to the, the way that the labour market is changing is, is crucial for any welfare and benefit system going forwards. Okay. Okay, I've got three members I want to come in. Um, Joan McAlpin first. Thank you very much. Just to um, focus on the issue of, of pay levels, um, obviously there's a lot of issues relating to when people feel unhappy with their work, but certainly in terms of the responses we've got, pay, pay is very important. Low pay is a really important factor. Now, we've talked quite a bit about... Um, the setting of the living wage, but the other evidence we've received suggests that there's there's two things that could two ways that you can regulate pay, and one is to set a good living wage, and the other is economies that have got organised labour, where labour is very well organised, such as Sweden, for example, which uh, raises uh, the uh, level of um, wages. Um, can can you can you cite any examples of workplaces where you can see that health is improved? because the workforce is better organised? <laughs> the study that's addressed that question directly rather than at a national level, like you've alluded to, um, the health of Sweden versus the, the health of England, for example, or Scotland. Um, I can't think of one that's looked at the effect of a, a workplace becoming more unionised. Um, certainly there are studies about when employees have more control and more involvement in work, for example, through workers' councils in someone like, like Germany that might be similar to what you're asking about. And that the evidence there does suggest that those kind of interventions, having more employee representation within the workforce and making decisions about the nature of work and indeed around pay for the top level of directors, there is evidence, some evidence from Germany that that, that can be beneficial for the health of those employees. Not in connection with pay, but uh, there have certainly been studies done in the past, I don't know how recent they are, which have looked at the impact on um, trade unions in preventing work-related ill health and injury. Uh, and the evidence is that where workers are fully engaged, involved in joint risk assessment with their employers, uh, then health and safety in the workplace is better managed. Um, and as Claire has, has talked about the importance of con control at work and the way that that can relate to improved self-reported health, so there's good evidence for that. In Scotland, um, control at work is lowest for those working in the, the hotel and restaurant and retail industries. Um, some evidence from the, the Scottish Health Survey. Um, and those industries also happen to be the lowest paid, um, or at least have a high concentration of low pay. So I think you can at least infer something reasonable from, from that. And so what do you think will be the effect of the UK government's proposed trade union legislation then on workers' health? I'm happy to take it, but I don't want to take all of the questions. Um, I think it will um, decrease over time in terms of, for example, what was mentioned there, if uh, trade unions are having a positive effect through engaging employees, taking their health and safety more seriously, ensuring that employers are implementing legislation, challenging discriminatory practices, for example, within the work workplace. If there's less ability for trade unions to do those kind of day-to-day -day case activities, then obviously that would have, I can extrapolate and say, a negative health effect. Um, the fact that obviously at the moment trade unions are only across around, what, 25 to 30 percent of the workforce, then there's already a, a, a huge kind of under-represented um, workforce. Um, 
in terms of the ability, if we go back to the question around pay, then obviously pay levels did increase from the, the post-war period through until the late 1970s in direct kind of correlation with, you could argue, an increase in trade union density and trade union influence within government, corporatist structures, etc. Countries, as you've alluded to, like Sweden and Denmark, where there's more involvement of trade unions within, um, within policy and within politics, do tend to have... Um, better workplaces, both in the terms of the physical environment and the psychosocial work environment. So I think there's a strong case that um, trade unions have historically and within a contemporary setting improved the health of the workforce and therefore the health of the public considerably. I think in policy terms, um, HSE has always looked at the characteristics of good health and safety management as requiring three things, leadership, good worker involvement and competence access by the employer to competent advice on health and safety. And that can come, of course, from trade union uh, health and safety representatives. But there are different models of, of worker engagement, uh, and not all of them are through the trade unions. But I think that, that the principle of good, strong worker involvement and the contribution that that makes to reducing ill health and injury from work-related activity will will prevail. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Chick Worthy. Uh, I'd like, if I may, convene to come back to the, the democratic participation in relation to management of, of companies and organisations, if I may, later. But j just talk about income. Uh, have you done, and Ms. Bamber, if I may ask you, have you done any, any consideration of the impact that equity participation has? I mean, it, it kind of makes, in some cases, makes the current proposal for living wage um, miserly in terms of if we encourage equity participation. And by the way, that doesn't, uh, having run companies uh, across Europe and finding that workers' councils and, uh, and, and uh, financial participation uh, produces more productivity, more jobs, uh, and even in the public sector with a committed cost basis where they can actually share in efficiency improvements. Have you done any analysis and comparison between companies that do have equity participation and those that don't. Um, and can I, can yeah. I just say that in my, in, before coming to this place, I was doing company turnarounds. In one company, we gave the shares, took them from the directors whom I fired, gave the shares to employees who'd been there more than a year. The company is now doing three times the revenue it was doing, uh, and there's a pension pot now being built up uh, uh, that, that uh, the employees share in. So have you done an analysis of the comparison of it? I'm afraid, I'm afraid I haven't, and I'm not aware of one. Well, I mean, do you have a view? Um, I, I can certainly give you a view, which is what I'm doing this morning. Um, I would think um, that it could have the potential benefit of increasing health on the basis that it's a principle of participation, involvement, and potentially control, because as shareholders they would have a vote uh, to AGMs, etc., and therefore an influence on things. But I am kind of getting a bit beyond my expertise and into personal yeah. opinion. Anyone... Yes, Lorna. I suppose just to add, and, and again, I'm not aware of specific studies that have, have done this, but, but a number of, of, of the responses that you got to the call for evidence reference, the Marmot Review, and, and the very comprehensive work that it did around yeah. um, the, the, the qualities of, of good work. And one of the issues that they flag up there around the participation in decision making, so not simply being around collective bargaining arrangements, but also the influence over, over the day-to-day -day decision making within the companies. And again, you might extrapolate that where companies have uh, greater involvement in decision making and processes around equity benefits and so on that that, 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 that would help to meet that criterion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kinsey, and good morning. Um, I actually had a constituent who made a, a simple view to me and I'd like to know your, your views on this. So the government at this moment in time are talking about housing uh, benefits and cuts and um, we have people who are working who don't get a decent wage, who therefore, because of that, need to claim housing benefit. Is the government not subsidising companies by allowing them not to pay a living wage? If these people pay the living wage, then the government would save on housing benefit. What do you think of that simplistic view? Stunned. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a, an, an economist or a, or a housing policy p 
person. However, um, I would probably, to some extent, agree with your constituent in the sense that one of the criticisms of tax credits was that they were effectively a subsidy for low wages and that they were also politically vulnerable um, in a way that decreasing wages might not be. Um, so I think there would be a case for increased wages in preference to a benefit system that's more politically vulnerable. And I also think there are studies around you know, people's self-respect from earning rather than receiving from the state. Yes, yeah, because, you know, the fact that... I think Lorna Kelly made the point earlier. Um, have you ever tried, and most people uh, are in this position where they're in work, they're then out of work, they need to go back to the housing office or the council or whatever, they need to fill in the form, by the time they get or go back to uh, the, the, the job centre, they need to fill in forms, they then need to wait on the money coming through, they may have to take a loan off of uh, uh, the, 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 the job centre. Then they have to pay it back, and, and it basically drives them down and down and down. And once they're into that circle, it's very hard to get out of. But anyway, can I come on to my... Sorry, maybe other people want to answer the first question. I've got a second question, yeah. convener. Yeah, I th I, just to pick up those points around the, the difference in where, where you get your money from, and I think that there is evidence that if you're able to, um, if you're able to earn a, a wage that that doesn't then rely on being topped up with benefits, that that has implications for um, for self-esteem, psychosocial benefits, and and so on. I, I think though I'd be slightly wary of getting into an argument that's about. Um, those on benefits and, and those who are not because such a large proportion of, of people in this country receive state benefits of, of one sort or another. So trying to say let's get to a situation where we have um, some people who are taxpayers and some people who are recipients is not necessarily helpful to, to this kind of debate. But what I want to see is I want to see companies pay a wage that they should that will, will ensure that people, you know, can, can live better. But anyway, I'll move on. Um, in your, uh, Lorna Kelly, in your submission, uh, again, you have put down, poverty has become a more significant factor in overall poverty rates, specifically in what poverty has changed from representing just over one-third, 37% of total relative poverty in 1999-2000, to almost half, 48% in 2010 11 uh, for the record, can you give the reasons for that? Um, it's partly around changes in, in overall poverty rates, so, so strides being made in reducing the number of people who, who are in relative poverty. Um, and uh, the, the, so the, num the absolute numbers in in-work poverty not changing significantly, but those making up a, the proportion that they make up of the overall numbers in, of households in poverty is, is bigger. Um, so we, we haven't been making strides on in-work poverty in the same way that we've been making strides for, for families where nobody is in work. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, John Lambert. Much. I, th I think I want to go back to the purpose of this um, inquiry, which was not so much about why it's unfair to individuals in terms of their health, but is there an economic impact of... Um, an economy which relies on people being in low-paid jobs and having job insecurity. So, you know, to persuade an employer that, it, that it's better to organise a slightly different way because economically it makes sense, I think is helpful. I wonder if you've done any work simply to quantify the consequences of the health impacts on individuals for um, employers or for the economy. Um, I think the, the, the route... Um there has been to focus on things like sickness absence. So when um, I did a review of um, interventions around some of these workplace interventions around control and participation, for example, um, our primary outcomes were health ones as health researchers, but we also included sickness absence within that. And you, there was evidence that sickness absence decreased. Um, so you you could then sell that to an employer in a sense that there's clearly a, a benefit for them. We also found in these studies that whilst health tended to improve, um, there weren't any negative effects on productivity. So it was a, a, not a, a loss for the employer and there was this potential gain around the cost of sickness absence. Mm. 
And have you done any work, or has anyone done any work, speaking to employers who have chosen, for example, to pay the living wage, or have chosen not to have zero hours contracts? And and whether that what's what has driven that kind of choice? I'm afraid I haven't. Um, not work that we we've done directly. Um, I, I I'm aware of probably more anecdotal of various employers who, who will talk about the impact that the living wage, for example, has had on, on, on their workforce. Um, those um, people who, who support women in business, for example, talking about the impact of having family-friendly policies on the productivity and ability of people to su sustain employment. So this is not just an issue around sickness rates and, and productivity of those in work, but the ability of people to stay in work for a prolonged period of time, avoiding then the significant Significant costs that are associated with with recruitment and with a high turnover within the workforce. Yeah, I'm aware even in high level um, engineering jobs, engineering companies who have changed their working practice to bring back women after they've had families, because otherwise that's skills that they're losing and having to recruit. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Um, we've touched a bit on ownership models and whether they make any difference. I don't know whether there's any examples of whether, if it's employee ownership or a cooperative, is that different, are their outcomes different there from straightforward employer-employee models? Not an area that I can comment on, I'm afraid. OK. And, well, I suppose the other thing that I am interested in, you talked about particular sectors with their particular problems. See, for example, in the care sector, is there any difference between a care sector worker under pressure working in the public sector or in the voluntary sector or in the private sector? Have we seen any evidence of different varying qualities? So it's not just within a, an occupation, but actually how that particular, how their work is run, how much control they've got. Have you got any evidence of that? Um, we, we've certainly done some work within within the third sector, and accepting that the third sector is is massively diverse. Um, so it hasn't explicitly contrasted public sector, private sector and third sector, but has picked out a, a number of issues around work quality within the third sector. Um, and generally within the third sector, what was coming back was that terms and conditions are are fairly good. There are a, a large number of living wage um, employers within the third sector um, and that there are... Um, benefits associated with doing work that's perceived to be of value or that fits with people's own own value systems. Uh, a, a lot of sense, though, that there is stress for the third sector as a whole and for particular parts of that associated with um, demands on services and that that causes then challenges for people in terms of stress at work, ability to feel that they're able to do a good work, a good job um, and a ability to feel that their workload is manageable um, and also so then in terms of job security, so where most people in the third sector may be on permanent contracts, those are only permanent to the extent that funding is continued. And as you'll know, many third sector organisations struggle with, with getting long-term funding in place. So there, there are differences by sector. We haven't directly compared those, but those are some insights in terms of what third sector workforce have said. And just could add to that just on a work related stress and obviously it's, it is difficult to distinguish between um, uh, causes of stress external to the workplace and work related stress but HSE um, developed management standards for um, controlling stress in the workplace and our evidence is that um, uh, work related stress is reported more in the public sector and that's where we're focusing our effort at seeking to get employers to take up and to implement the management standards as part of their compliance with their General Health and Safety at Work Act duties. Because people feel more comfortable about identifying stress of the work in the public sector? It, it, rather it could private. well be. It could well be. And it could well be that um, uh, there is a greater density of trade union representation and the report is coming through supported by trade unions. Um, but certainly uh, the... the the evidence that we're working on is partly based on self-reporting um, through the Labour Force Survey, for example. Um, but public sector is, is is really where we're concentrating our efforts. Now, that's not to say that the, uh, as you said, private sector care providers, for example, um, uh, and and people working in the private sector care industry experience the same level of stress as in the public sector. Uh, we don't know that, uh, but certainly. Uh, it is worth us concentrating our efforts on the management standards in, in areas of the public sector. 
on this issue, final point on this issue, is there any correlation between access to being able to progress at your work, access to skills and training, and satisfaction at work in terms of your health and wellbeing? We talked earlier about the opportunities to, to progress through education, which is why I think there's a major problem with the cuts to further education. So that's a really important step for people. But I wonder whether there's a correlation between employers who provide good skills, training, access to progress and opportunities to, to move on in your job and health. Um, yes, certainly one of, one of the things you would look for as a characteristic of good job is the opportunity to progress and also the opportunity for people to do a, a job which enables them to use their, their skills and their abilities. And there's certainly some evidence of um, difference in the opportunities for, for progression and support. Uh, I'm sure between sectors, but certainly between different, um, different types of employees. So, for example, employees who already have high levels of qualifications are more likely to get support in work for progression and further study than those who have low levels of qualifications. So there's an inequality there and a risk of people being trapped in relative low pay. Uh, brief supplementary from Chick Yeah, If I may ask uh, Sarah Jones, you, you talk about the public sector. We, we, we uh, well, the, the committee did an, on, uh, an online survey, uh, which uh, 600 people, uh, which indicated that uh, and 60 percent of these worked in the public sector, 30 percent in the private sector, and the, the others. And of that number, 74 percent of respondents said their job was good, which would tend to suggest that. About 44% of what have you in the public sector thought their job was good if you apply it across the board. So I don't understand what, uh, your comments uh, about the public sector. But how, on the basis of stress, and, and which the uh, survey indicated was the, was the stress, anxiety, or depression was the the, the, the most uh, the biggest health create problem creators. Um, I wonder if I might ask you about, you talked about management standards. I think it was Warren Buffy that said, uh, to be successful, you required integrity, intellect and energy. And if you didn't have the first one, the other two were a waste of time. I mean, when you talk about management standards, could you comment on the impact that poor management, in your view, has had on the health of the workers below them? And what do we need to do to ensure that, uh, I'll leave the banking sector aside for a minute, what do we need to do to ensure that we achieve the management standards, which will help alleviate a lot of the problems that we have with health of workers in their workplace? Um, well, the, the reason that we developed the management standards for helping employers to control work-related stress um, was because we felt that they needed some additional guidance to comply with the general duty to uh, protect people's health and um, uh, safety in the workplace. So we developed them uh, according to the, the, the six principles of, of characteristics of a, a good workplace, which means that, that, that the leadership within the workplace needs to manage the demands uh, to offer people as much control over um, their work activity as possible, to support them, to encourage them to progress, uh, to look at the relationships in particular between individuals and their line managers, um, to clarify their role, to make sure they understand the role that they have within the workplace, and to manage change in the workplace as effectively and as uh, carefully as possible. And where um, the uh, larger employers have taken up the management standards, um, it's, I think it, 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 the, the employer um, takes on a lot of responsibility because it requires them to do a survey in the first place of what their employees are telling them about the way in which the workplace is run. Uh, but certainly um, one of the, the characteristics that we encourage with, in all employers is to show strong leadership. Uh, in managing health and safety. And I think one of the, uh, um, the things that comes through in some of the other submissions on to this inquiry is that employers need to show leadership, not just individually within their own um, uh, businesses, but across industries. And where HSE is having some success in individualist industries is getting the leadership uh, across industry to take responsibility for uh, the levels of health and safety performance in that industry and to share with us the responsibility of improving uh, um, practice in order to comply both with the management standards on stress, but the whole range of other issues of complying with, with good health and safety practice. Could you not 
think of it, just if I may convene, do you not think that uh, they, the leaders, the managers, have a short-sighted view of what they're trying to achieve, particularly when it comes to their remuneration and their position? I mean, do you think, do you see a, a, a change, a seismic change, that managers will become good managers by firstly treating their employees uh, and their colleagues in the workplace in a proper fashion? Um, I don't think I've got any particular evidence that I can bring to the table on, on, on that particular issue. But certainly where there is evidence of um, senior managers within an organisation taking the health and safety of their employees seriously at board level and at management board level, um, there is evidence of better performance. Thank you. Briefly, uh, Robert. Yeah, very, very briefly, just... Basically, on this question, we're talking about evidence, and obviously you can measure. It concerns me that what about those that don't engage, those companies that, that won't engage? Uh, um, what can HSE do to, uh, with regard to them? Because if there's no engagement, then you can't actually have this broad spectrum of actually gathering evidence. So how can you measure? Uh, we inspect um, we target our inspections at uh, the those industries and those occupations where we've got evidence of high risk either in terms of um, uh, the potential for ill health or the potential for injury and um, last year in fact over the, the last three years we did an average of about 2,400 inspections in Scotland and we found since we have introduced um, a fee for when we find a material breach of the law, um, we have served over 3,500 notices of contravention. So we can enforce the law, uh, and we can enforce the law uh, all the way to um, recommending to the Procurator Fiscal that the company should be prosecuted. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll go back to John Lund. Health and safety issues um, in particular, I wonder... Um, what do you think are the reasons for Scotland's relatively high workplace fatality rates? If you look at, if you look at the um, data in terms of um, standardising it by occupation and industry, Scotland has a very similar record to other parts of, of GB. Um, so it's really the driver of, of risk in the workplace in terms of health and safety is to do with the type of activity that a person undertakes. It's the occupation and the industry rather than where they happen to be working. So Scotland disproportionately has unsafe workplaces then? No, I'm saying actually it's very similar to other parts of, of Britain. But it's because we disproportionately have industries that might create risk? It's because of industry and the, the industry and occupational makeup, yes, of different parts of the country, have the most impact on the performance in terms of health and safety. So, for example, London and the South East, where you have a lot of relatively low-risk workplaces, a lot of people work in offices, um, that shows up in the injury and ill health statistics. Um, and London and the South East has a relatively lower. Um, so uh, does that rate mean that you target health? resource and, in, and inspection on areas of higher risk which disproportionately involve Scotland? Yes, we, we target it on the basis of, of higher risk industries where we've got that evidence, yep. So that for example in terms of ill health, um, this year we are targeting um, respirable crystalline silica in those industries where it is, is used and we're targeting asthma gins in um, certain parts of man the manufacturing industry. We're targeting musculoskeletal disorders in construction and in um, the food manufacturing industry because we have the evidence that those create the highest levels of ill health. In terms of um, enforcement, can you clarify what, what has become the responsibility of local government in terms of sector and... and um, the HSE itself? Yes. Um, the, uh, essentially, the split is between um, offices and shops, which are enforced by local authorities, and they have the statutory responsibility for enforcing health and safety at work um, law in those premises, and we do the high risk end of the spectrum. Um, now, when I say high risk, uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that the, um, all the premises that local authorities inspect are low risk, particularly in some of, of the health issues, uh, for example, work-related stress. The correlation between 
the areas that responsibility of local government um, for enforcement and poor health of, of workforce, so whether it's in retail um, and shops and so on. So what do you do to ensure that enforcement by local authorities is properly resourced? Because one thing the local authorities have that responsibility is something different than for them to have the capacity to do that. And we know that local government particularly has suffered in terms of cuts to their budgets and so on. So what do you do to ensure or to make the case for more funding for local government because they're unable to enforce or use the powers that they've got because they simply haven't got the resources to do it. HSC doesn't have a role in the funding of local authorities. Um, however, we do um, direct the health and safety system and we do set certain expectations on local authority environmental health officers to go to the right places and to look at the right things. But in terms of their, um, their level of resources, which um, from memory, I think there are about... 80 full-time equivalent environmental health officers working across the 32 Scottish local authorities who are full-time equivalent on health and safety statutory duties, um, which of course uh, they, do, uh, in con they do alongside other duties, food standards for example, or trading standards, but there are about 80 um, environmental officers at the moment <coughs> working full-time on health and safety. This may be an area that we want to look at a bit further because I'd I do think we go back to the point, it's not just they have the responsibility, but you then have the capacity to ensure it's enforced, because um, if it's not enforced, if there's not somebody speaking up and there's not somebody in investigating, then there's the opportunity there for, for neglect. I'm not sure if the, uh, the committee's invited local authorities to give evidence, but um, it, it might be worth inviting the Society of Chief Officers of Environmental Health, for example. Thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald, follow up. And, and that was very helpful, what you said, that um, in terms of uh, fatalities, it's more about the nature of work run rather than where it's located in the UK. Is that a similar picture when we look at the number of sick days? Because what, was, what we, we had uh, in the briefing paper was that Scotland had 2.2 million uh, days lost uh, due to sickness. Um, when you compare that... Um, with other areas of, of the United Kingdom, you find that Scotland's sick days are 21% lower than the northeast of England, 21% lower than the East Midlands, 19% lower than, than Wales, 17% lower than the southwest of England, and so on. And since 2006, the number of days lost um, have dropped from 3.7 million to 2.2 million. So what is driving that? If, if it's a similar pattern um, because of the nature of the work rather than location, why has Scotland performed so much better than the rest of the UK where, where Great Britain has come down by 26% in lost days since 2006 7 but Scotland's actually come down 42%? Um, I don't know is the short answer to that, but the um, uh, sickness absence figures, of course, will include sickness absence due to other causes than work-related, um, and HSE is purely interested in work-related sickness absence. However, um, we are doing a lot more work on delving more deeply into injury and ill health statistics precisely for that reason, to see if we can get to the bottom of the real reasons for differences that we see between nations and regions. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, our evidence is that that is strongly driven, driven by the type of work and occupation. So I think it might be interesting to look at sickness absence data standardised by industry and occupation. I mean, I had a couple of points on that. I think the overall time trend for the whole of the UK, with a decrease since 6-7, mm -hmm. is possibly to do with the effects of an economic downturn mm -hmm. on the people who are in work, make them worried about taking sickness absence when they need it, so you get presenteeism, for example. I think a second point is around, and it might relate to the Scottish-English division that you noted is that obviously when the economy contracts certain people are more likely to lose their jobs than others we've talked a lot about people with low pay low skills there's also the issue of people with pre-existing health conditions or people who have a track record of sickness absence and obviously there'd be a big overlap between those people so they may have exited the labor market so they won't be in that time trend data you might say perhaps in scotland there were 
higher increases in unemployment and perhaps more people with ill health conditions dropped out of the labour market and that might be a reason for the difference that you noted but that's just a speculative comment it's not something I've considered. I think that's a fair point actually it might be totally unrelated to occupation there might be other uh, economic factors which which are having an impact on that but nevertheless the more we can do um, provided you've got the sample sizes to actually you know delve more deeply into the statistics then you know the more interesting information you might find whether it's by sector whether it's by occupation I think is a difficult thing to say. Right. And in terms of the level of sickness, has there been any relationship identified between the number of sick days lost and, and job insecurity? Not by agency. No. I, I don't know. I don't know. Of, uh, I can't think of one, I'm afraid, at the moment. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just again, some of the health and safety aspects and, and where that stands. I was, I was struck by Claire Bamber's conclusions that one of the key things to do about uh, low quality work or work that uh, is bad for health was to uh, enforce more uh, thoroughly or more frequently uh, and also uh, to tighten up regulation in relation, for example, to the psychological impacts of work and so on. I'd be interested to hear a bit more from Claire Bambra about those conclusions and, and, and the evidence base of them and also from other witnesses about how that would uh, or would or could be uh, translated into practice. I'm conscious that HSE has had its own financial pressures to face as well and, and uh, while recognising the limits of what Sarah Jones may or may not be able to say would that be interesting to have some reflection on that. Thanks. Um, uh, just sort of reinforcing what Sarah was saying earlier, there, there is evidence um, from studies to show that when more regular inspection of workplaces take place, for example, in, in construction, then you do get better health and safety compliance within those workplaces. I mean, fairly logical, but there is research to underpin that. So therefore, you can say that if you had more um, implementation of the legislation, i.e. more inspections, and potentially also things like increased fines, so there actually is quite a big impact on an, an employer who's seen to be doing bad practice, then you'd expect that to have a beneficial effect on the health and safety environment of those workforces. HSE's um, kind of um, remit is, in, in my view, largely around physical work environment and physical health conditions So some of the examples that you were talking about in terms of when you can inspect. Um, inspecting for is this a psychologically damaging workplace it's not within your remit. However, um, legislation in other countries such as Sweden and Norway, they do have health and safety legislation around governing the psychosocial work environment as well as around the physical work environment. Um, and studies have shown that these countries tend to have less stressful work environments. They tend to be the same places that are implementing the other sorts of interventions I've, I've talked about. So employers are bringing in employees more into um, having control and consultancy within the, the decisions made in the company. You could argue partly because of that legislative um, framework directing that, but that would be a bit of an extrapolation around cause and effect uh, from me. But there are alternative routes. One is about if you have legislation, you have to implement it. Um, and, and there are certain ways of doing that. And if you implement it more, the evidence would suggest that you'd get a, a better uh, impact. And the second aspect is there are other aspects of the work environment that could be regulated within this country that haven't been um, looking at other countries. If I could just pick up on the, um, uh, the changes in the construction industry, I think um, it is not necessarily true to say that that is the result of um, the number of inspections alone that we do in the construction industry. It's very much been about applying a mixture of interventions, including, as I was saying earlier, getting industry to step up, step up to the plate itself and for sharing that responsibility with the regulator um, and both you know, the trade union efforts in, in that industry as well as employers' efforts. So it's a mixture of interventions and... HSE has been in construction in an intensive way for a, a long while, uh, and that model, I think, has, has what's shown improvement. It hasn't yet shown the complete culture change that we would like to see, and we would like to, to translate that kind of model to other industries as well, if there was a willingness by industry leaders to take it up. 
Um, just on the uh, the biopsychosocial aspects of, of ill health at work, um, it's true that we, we are not geared up to, to inspect for those particular issues. However, um, I mentioned the stress management standards earlier, and they really they are the product of quite a lot of research, including actually they were informed by NHS Health Scotland's development of Work Positive, uh, which looks at uh, the way in which work-related stress can be managed. And we would see the increased take-up of those management standards as being an important part of compliance with health and safety overall. And that's why we're having a, a, another push at the management standards. Because we've noticed that where we develop toolkits, we develop guidance for employers to comply with the law, and then we kind of vacate the scene a little bit, um, then things slip away. Uh, and we know actually now that we're in this for the long haul, uh, but we want to work with, other, with others to do that. For example, um, other organisations in Scotland, like the Scottish Centre for Healthy Working Lives. And I think the emphasis in Scotland on a mentally healthy workplace is going to help in that respect in terms of managing work-related uh, stress. Uh, that's very interesting. I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious to examine or, or explore a little further whether, uh, if you like, the, the pro providing best practice guidance uh, is sufficient where there are clearly in most sectors good employers and less good employers and some who simply flout the best practice guidance altogether, uh, is, 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 the, is the view from inside HSE that there's a need for more legislative backup in order to um, make that guidance mandatory or make that guidance effective uh, in some of the industries where there's a problem? And, and particularly, uh, is there a view that uh, the resource we Joanne Lamont asked about the resourcing of local authority uh, enforcement for the, in the areas for which local authorities are responsible. I'd be interested in your view on resourcing of HSE uh, implementation or enforcement where you're responsible, either onshore or indeed offshore, uh, for, for, for those standards. In, in terms of the body of legislation, um, it, it is a very mature um, body of legislation. I mean, the Health and Safety at Work Act has been around for a long time since the, the, the Robins report in 1972 introduced the Act in 74. And we have just been through the process, a, a process of rationalising and simplifying legislation and the guidance that goes with it. Um, because I think with the best will in the world, um, we recognised that some of that guidance had become overlapping, it had become complex and difficult for employers to get to grips with. Um, so I think the guidance that backs up uh, the legislation is incredibly important uh, and HSC will look to see whether that guidance is being followed. So it is part of, of the whole approach. Um, we don't think that there needs to be any new regulation in this particular area um, and I think the, the, the point about the legislation is it is there and it can be enforced and we have taken enforcement action for example on health issues and on work-related stress and the power of that example of um, taking enforcement action, not in very many cases, I have to say, in terms of work-related stress, um, should serve as a lesson to all employers. Uh, and the, the, the maximum publicity that we can get for when we do take enforcement action helps us considerably. Just on resources, um, uh, I can't comment on you know uh, the funding of, of HSE, which comes through our uh, stewardship department, Department for Work and Pensions. Uh, but we have at the moment approximately um, 60 um, staff based in Scotland, uh, and that includes uh, that that's frontline inspectors and specialists based in Scotland working outside the field of major hazards. If you look at major hazards, it goes up quite a lot. But having said that, we draw on a lot of expertise from uh, other parts of Britain, and our headquarters is based in Bootle. In fact, I've got uh, policy colleagues here from our Bootle headquarters today. So we draw on a range of expertise and, and resources from, from down south as well. Thank you very much. Okay, follow up. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Just a, a bit of clarity. Well, we've heard two things th this morning. One, that you've, you've stated the number of inspections has been increasing in Scotland, and we've also heard a call that there needs to be more inspections. So just for, for the record, can, can you tell us um, of the, I think you said 2,400 inspections had taken place. What proportion is that of the total number of inspections carried out throughout the UK? 
And secondly, I noticed that uh, Northern Ireland has its own regulator. Um, you know, is there a particular reason for that? And, you know, if, if it's important that you can call on expertise from the rest of the UK, why is that not the case for Northern Ireland? Um, we're in touch with Northern Ireland quite a lot, actually, HSE Northern Ireland, and we do work together on, on some issues. Um, the fact that HSE has, uh, the, the Northern Ireland has its own HSE is, is because of the historical legis uh, historic ev evolution of the constitution, really. Um, I don't think there's any particular um, uh, policy decision uh, uh, behind that, but we, we work closely with HSE Northern Ireland. Just on the, um, the number of inspections you asked about in Scotland, um, that figure I gave you was the three-year average for the past, the most recent three years. And actually, I think it, it, it is slightly more than 10% of the overall number of inspections across the whole of Britain. Is that the nature of, again, the industries in Scotland as opposed to other parts of the UK? And would that no, be I don't. No, I don't think there's any uh, any particular um, reason for that, other than um, we are much more careful now about how we target our inspections, and we try not to go to places where we don't have a reason to go, and we try to gather as much evidence as we can uh, to go to the right places. And when I say go to the right places. I mean places where we have reason to believe that we will find a material breach of the law. Okay. Okay, and lastly, I think we're going to go back to Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask about the impact on well-being as well as health and safety from nighttime working. Um, nighttime jobs will cover a wide range from high-skilled, high-paid, secure jobs with a lot of control and autonomy, but many of them low-paid, insecure, physically stressful environments, uh, environments where tiredness leads to direct safety risks, uh, where people, for example, leaving work late at night may be unsafe getting home. Uh, many Glasgow nightclubs, for example, won't necessarily provide transport or taxis for people leaving their workplace at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. Um, but also the developing understanding about the long-term impact on health and well-being of living your life against the grain of the, the natural rhythms of what would, most people would call a body clock. Um, do we know enough about the health, well-being and safety implications of nighttime working? And given that nighttime working is unlikely to go away anytime soon, what can we do to address those those issues and look after the, the well-being of, of people in those kind of jobs? I think the, there's quite a strong, well-established and long-standing evidence base that would answer your question around the health effects of night work and shift work more generally as well, because obviously there's often an overlap. And um, mortality rates um, from cardiovascular disease, all causes, um, gastrointestinal problems, tiredness, fatigue, injury and accident rates kind of the list goes on are basically all higher amongst uh, night workers and also your points about the kind of social desynchronization that people experience in terms of work-life balance all those kind of issues are also uh, kind of well established within the literature um, there has been less research but still some um, kind of reasonable quality studies around the sort of interventions that be, could be done to mitigate the effects of, of night work within a kind of 24-hour economy. Um, and these range from um, quite um, low-level interventions around having special lights that will help with melatonin levels in the skin, for example, all the way through to things like um, changing the nature of shift work rotation so that when you come on and off a shift, depending on which pattern you could take, it can be better or worse for your circadian rhythms. So there's quite a range of potential interventions. Um, I'm not sure there's a silver bullet, but there are things that could be done to make it less worse than it, it currently is for health. Anyone else? Yes. It was um, so some specific examples that have been given to us from people trying to juggle work and childcare responsibilities, um, where where nighttime working can often be seen as a good option because um, you may have a partner who's who's at home overnight. You can go out to work overnight, come back that can come back the next day. And impacts being noted from people around 
tiredness, you know, working overnight and then still coming back and having family responsibilities during the day. And also on, on the dynamics within the household and relationship with partners. If you're never seeing your partner, you're playing this kind of tag team approach to, to, to managing your family. I, I think one of the other issues that, that it flags up is people's sense of whether or not they have a, have a choice. Um, and, and this links to the previous discussion, I think, about the role of regulation versus the role of um, individual choice in being able to, to choose to go for a different job if you can't get one that's of, that's of good quality in, uh, on a number of different measures. So a sense amongst a lot of those who are stuck in kind of low pay, low quality work that they don't have any option. Um, and that might be because of skills, it might be because of confidence, it might be because of other family responsibilities, so unpaid care, whether that's child care or, or, or looking after elderly relatives and people feeling that they don't have the choice to choose what may be a, a healthier form of work because of a number of these other barriers. We um, have commissioned a, a further study, um, but it's due to report quite soon in December, and we're in touch with the Scottish Government because it's looking at shift work and disease. Um, it's being done by Oxford University. Uh, but we're in touch with the Scottish Government because we, we believe that um, the response to that research is going to need a range of policy um, uh, responses which are going to go much broader than health and safety at work. Mm -hmm. um, but that is... Um, uh, that is due to report in December. Well, I think we may have signed off the report on this inquiry by that point, but perhaps we'll, we'll be able to, to look at it uh, in advance of any committee debate on, on, on this inquiry. Uh, I suppose just very finally, um, again, not a silver bullet, uh, but would it be reasonable to uh, suggest that uh, nighttime working deserves a higher minimum wage than... Uh, daytime working is would that be the kind of signal that says we take this issue seriously and we want employers to recognize that this is a, a much greater burden we're asking people to bear in exchange for the uh, the, the, the remuneration that they're getting historically higher risk jobs have tended to have a, a pay premium attached to them haven't they I mean um, at least uh, in, in kind of recent times I guess it would be a way of making a trade-off between your health and your income. Um, arguably, it'd have to be quite quite a decent amount higher to make up. Um, I'm sure you could get an economist to do some modelling for you to get you a precise figure. But yes, in principle. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I suppose just a, a, a couple of points, just a, a general point that um, Scotland does seem to have a, a higher proportion of um, shift work more generally than the rest of the, rest of the uh, British, the regions of, of Britain. Um, and the second point is there's some work done recently through the Health Survey for England um, and they looked at predictors of bad health among uh, chief workers, who would include the, those working in the nighttime economy and um, living in a low income household um, and also low, low qualifications. They emerge as um, drivers of particularly bad health for that group as well. So Potentially, it could, it could partly compensate for that poorer, poorer health. So, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I, I wonder if you'd be able to comment on the fact that it, you've suggested maybe it's not legislation that we maybe need to uh, implement, but is it just a, a change in culture? Is culture a factor that we need to sort of drill down to? Um, last week, I, I, I was hearing from uh, an executive from Nexon, uh, uh, an offshore company, uh, and they say that basically they have started looking at the, the culture of the industry and the workforce, and they've seen a significant change because of the way they've embraced that. Um, and I'm just wondering if it, if, it's, if, it is, if it is more cultural, where in Europe do you think we could learn lessons from in terms of, there are examples of, of uh, other European countries which seem to be healthier and indeed happier. So what could we learn from other European countries and is it because of their culture? Professor Bamber, maybe. Ah. It's not, that's not an easy uh, kind well, of, I you know, it's easy. I, I can't tweet my answer to that one, I think. Um, it's a, yeah, more challenging, I think, probably the most challenging one today. Um, I think we obviously can learn a lot, and I've alluded to some of the uh, Scandinavian countries. Um, arguably, there are cultural differences, 
but there are also, as I've mentioned earlier, legislative differences, differences in terms of trade union density, political cultural differences in terms of involvement of um, organised labour, in historically at least, within, within those countries. So I don't think the cultural question can be detached from the political and legislative question. Thank you. Okay. Else on the offer of you? you want to I think less so on the, the direct sort of health and safety issues, but on, on issues like balancing work and child care, you certainly see differences in attitudes uh, across European countries. Um, and again, you'd have to point to some of the Northern European, Scandinavian countries uh, for, for differences around that. Um, and we gave the example, I think, in our response of places like Gothenburg in Sweden, which are trialling a six-hour working day in, in, in certain parts. Um, to, to see what happens, uh, and it's you know based on a, a premise that, that that may increase productivity and reduce sickness absence. Now we, we don't know how we don't know how that will go and what the outcomes of that will be, but there are certainly other places around Europe who are trying out different ways of working um, to, to address a number of the issues that we've raised this morning. In, in terms of the, uh, work-related injury and ill health, um, Scotland has. A relatively good record within the UK on Eurostat measures uh, with other European uh, countries. Um, you can't regulate for happiness, uh, but certainly I think that uh, um, if we continue to see industry and specific industries um, becoming responsible for a culture change, and it's not just about culture, it's about their reputation, and you've seen a number of large businesses recently actually realising that some of their working practices and the way they, they treat employees is not going too well, down too well with the, with the gen general public. Uh, it's also about reputation, not just culture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think that concludes our session. On behalf of the committee, can I thank you all for coming along this morning and giving us your time. Uh, we will now uh, suspend and go into private session.